Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to look at Acts 4. I want Sacrifice is one of the components. It's a key component. You should get comfortable with it. Sacrifice creates an atmosphere for miracles. You're not, you're not going to get an atmosphere of miracles, supernatural things happening without sacrifice. There's going to be sacrifice. Just adjust to that. There's going to be some sacrifice that goes on. Uh, if you're not willing to sacrifice, then you're, you're not going to be able to create the atmosphere. Sacrifice creates an atmosphere for miracles. Now, you heard me say this over and over and over and over and over again, that if you take this water, which is in this temperate environment, a liquid, and put it into an extreme environment like a freezer, it will change its molecular structure from a liquid to a, to a solid. If I take it out of the freezer and I put it on the stove and I put, turn on the heat, that solid will turn into a liquid and it will turn into a gas till it's completely evaporated. So the atmosphere changes it. It's obvious the atmosphere changes it. Because we haven't done anything to the water except change the atmosphere. Yet somehow, some of us still believe that you can do whatever you want to do and you're going to get a different atmosphere. You're not. Collectively, we have to understand what creates the atmosphere for miracles in the kingdom and it's sacrifice. Sacrifice. You can't be stubborn, hard-headed, stingy, cheap, lying, manipulating, doing all the things that worldly people do. And because you come to church, I love the Lord. He loves me. Everything is good. Nah. It's more important to do the right things outside the house. Well, you're asking me to sacrifice. Yes. If I don't, I like that. I like that show. I like to drink that. I like that. I like, I like, I like, I like. Some of those things that you like, you need to ask the Lord to take them from you. Take the like. Take the like. You don't have to stop it. Just give it to him. Then he'll put in you a disdain for the things that he disdains. And a love for the things that he loves. And you'll change. You'll change. I promise you, you'll change. And when the atmosphere in your heart changes... Your behavior changes, and the things that God does change, and you'll start creating an atmosphere for miracles because you're willing to sacrifice. You ever been in a kind of a place where you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? I don't, I can't, I don't believe. That's ridiculous. Those people, rah, rah, those people, rah, 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 rah. I don't understand why the government, rah, 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 rah. no, you're not a stuff, because you think you're right. And everybody else is a bunch of knuckleheads who don't know what they're doing. Hmm. I'm just saying, if you would sacrifice a little, get off your, your high seat and start serving, you might find a different experience. And God's driving you, moving you to a place of sacrifice so he can change you. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. It says, now the entire group, verse 32, now the entire group of those who believe were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. Let me park for a second there. 
um, right now, what we do is everything that we have is ours. This, this atmosphere doesn't exist in America today. It doesn't exist. I'm going to read it again so that you can't miss it. Now, the entire group of those who believed were of one heart. These are believers. These are those who are born again. One heart, one mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But instead, they held everything in common. Now, right now, in what year is this? 2024. That's crazy talk. That's crazy. It's crazy. My house belongs to everybody. My cars are available. My food is it's available. I, 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 that's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. That's why we don't see miracles. That's why the end of God is not, is on the outside looking in. I didn't write this. Don't get mad at me. This is, if you want it, there's some behaviors that must change in order for us to consistently walk in the place of miracle. Now listen, you can't change the external atmosphere until you change the internal atmosphere. Once you change the internal atmosphere, the external atmosphere will always change. Number one ingredient, sacrifice. Sacrifice creates an atmosphere for miracles. With great power, verse 33, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was on them all. The reason the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection because those guys had already sacrificed. They had given everything to walk with Jesus. They didn't hold anything in as their own. And these guys would give up their life ultimately. They would all die. But they would all come back. Just like Jesus died. And then he comes back. And just like one day, we will die. But we'll all come back. There's not any person in this room who's born again that will not experience eternal life. Don't, so don't hang on to this temporary life like it's the best thing you've ever had. It's just because you've never tasted eternal life. If you tasted eternal life and you experienced it, you would give everything you own for it. So these guys got it. They just got it ahead of us. They just got it. And they realized, man, all the stuff I have cannot even compare to the kingdom of the living God. So I'll give anything. I'll share, share everything. I'll sacrifice the whole thing, just to be with God in the kingdom to live forever. And I'm out of my earth suit, this corruption. And so because that was their mindset, the power of God was in them. And if you want the power of God, then you have to change the atmosphere. With great power, verse 33, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was on them all. For there was not a needy person among them because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, who was translated son of encouragement. Who was, who was Barnabas' 
partner? Saul. Saul that would become Paul. Uh, they became partners in the ministry together. Right now, Barnabas has given this extravagant gift, but it was kind of a normal gift. He sold a field and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That was just, that was just not an extraordinary thing back then. It would be extraordinary today. It would be really extraordinary today. But it wasn't so extraordinary then. But it was, it was significant. Let me say that. And Barnabas was a giver. And I'm not asking you to give anything. I'm just talking about if you're going to create an atmosphere of miracle, there's going to have to be sacrifice. It's not going to happen without sacrifice. Your name's not going to be great in the kingdom of God without sacrifice. Sometimes you're thinking, well, I want the power of God to flow through me. Sacrifice. I'm not trying to just sacrifice. Here's one of the ways you can sacrifice. Stop sleeping. Wake up a little earlier. If you've got to go to work, and so you've got to get up at 6, get up at 5. Get up at five and spend an hour, five to six, in the presence of King Jesus. Fast a little bit. That's the devil. <laughs> Not the devil calling you to fast. Fast. Stop eating. And, I, and actually, a fast is an absence of food. It's not I'm eating chicken strips not turkey, because I'm fasting turkey. I'm fasting turkey. <laughs> okay. I'm not messing up. Just stop. <clears throat> I'm just saying, if you want different results, you're not getting the results, you're going to have to change the input. You can't put the same input in into the same atmosphere and expect the output to change. The output's not going to change. If you keep the same process, you got to flip the process. Mm. So these, this is a life habit that the apostles had adopted. And they had much sacrifice in it. And they were, they were devoted to the things of God. It's, it's a selfless way to live. Let me give you a couple of systems. The U.S. practices a system, and we call the system what? Capitalism. That's our system. That's how we function. And uh, it's an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit. Private owners for profit. This is, we all live in that capitalistic system in America. We're, in Ameri we're Americans. We live in a system. And if you thrive in the system, then you've got, multi, you've got homes and cars and, and more, more food than you can eat because you put it in the freezer and then you, in the refrigerator, and then you transfer it from the refrigerator to the freezer and just make it sustain. And after a while, you look at that stuff that's been in the back of the freezer and you look and say, whoa, what is this? Because it's all frosted over. You don't even really know what it is anymore. What the, what is this? And, and then you kind of maybe thaw it out. Then you smell and go, ooh. And then you toss it out. And then you, you'll go to the store because we live in the land of abundance. So you roll into a Costco and fill up another card full of stuff that you go ultimately throw some of that stuff away because you have so much. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just telling you this is a culture, capitalism, that, that we live in. It's not the kingdom. It's capitalism. We are citizens of the kingdom. But we practice a system called capitalism. Now, I know it's not shocking to you, although you probably not have thought about it like that. That's not really God's system. It's a good system. And if we do it right, God will bless us. The system thrives as long as, as it's an okay system if those in the system are aggressively generous with those who do not have anything in the system. If 
you as, as leaders in the kingdom of God and live your life in a capitalistic system, the system is okay as long as you are aggressively generous with those who do not have provision in the system. If, you're, if you hold on to what you have, keep, I'm not going to share this. I've worked my tail off to get that. These lazy people don't know. For whatever reason you give that you're not going to share in the system, you are not supporting the system of the kingdom of God. That's not God's way. All right. you, and you might thrive in capitalism. You might, I mean, you might be the most, the Bill Gates of life. Right, the resource billions, not millions. Most of us are not even getting thousands, but there you get the billions. And but you will exit your earth suit too. And you will exit your earth suit, stand before Yeshua, eyeball to eyeball, and give an account of what you did with all the wasted paper. And the Lord will say, I gave you all this wasted paper, this green, this dead presidents, these pictures. And what did you do with them that advanced the kingdom that I bled out to give you access to? And then some will say, well, Lord, I gave a, I gave a token. He'll judge that for what it is. For us, we are faithful. And we sacrifice. And we'll do anything God calls us to do at any time. If the government controls, same system, different systems, the government controls distribution rights of good at its own discretion, it's called socialism where you make this, but the government controls it. It, can, it can, controls, I take all the stuff and then I distribute it as I see fit. It's not really yours. It's really ours. Socialism, we own, we control this, not yours. And then we distribute it as we see fit because you're not smart enough to distribute it. And we are so much smarter and we have a desire to bless everybody. And so we're going to take your resources and go bless everybody else. That's socialism. That's a system here on the planet. It's not the kingdom of God system. It's certainly not even the system we use here. But it is a system. Communism advocates all property is publicly owned. So nobody has anything. And we own. Everything is publicly owned. Everyone works and receives goods based on the determination of the ruling power or the government. So I can give you what I want to give you when I want to give it to you. It's not yours. It's not yours. It's mine. So it's not a bad system if the, if the ruling powers are benevolent. I, my kids live under that system. And they got, a, they got a benevolent leader, right? So we provide for all our kids. They don't work for this stuff. Who bought you that New York hat? One of those two sitting next to you, huh? Yeah. Can I stand? It's a good system. He loves the system. Man, my kids, they're, they're grown. They're not even little any longer. And they still love the system, right? I'm trying to say, get along. Get in your own system. They love the system. My dad, man, he's there. I love that. Woo! Go, dad. You can do this. Yeah, they're rooting for me. Because it's just a different system. Here's, here's our kingdom. Here's our system. This is how we live. The kingdom of God operates under the culture of love, mercy, forgiveness, giving and receiving, Thankfulness, it's a distinct system that puts God first. It 
So we can't, we gotta choose that system. That's his way. And so we don't claim anything is mine. We trust God that he's gonna provide. And then we're generous. We give to other people. We give, we give, and so we, we structurally give. We give uh, through programs. We give across the nations. We give locally and globally. You give. And so because that's God's system. So we take resources through tithes and offerings and we push it back out. You push it back out. and It goes back to your credit, to your faithfulness. And the system changes. And God honors us for that faithfulness. Let me just tell you something. You can't outgive God. No matter what you give, if you give everything that you have, he's going to give you more. He's always going to take whatever you give him and mold it and then give you back more. If, if part of what he gives you is just honor in his kingdom. And so you're sitting in the highest places in the kingdom of God forever because he honors those who honor him. And you gave something that's just, just dead presidents. And, 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 and now he honors you for your faithfulness to give something that is monopoly money. You know, in the kingdom of God, the, all that resource that you have right now that you hold near and dear and, and you, gotta, you got people watching over it and, and measuring it and making sure it multiplies, it's all paper, it's all play money. It has no value in the earth suit. When you exit the earth suit, it has no value. You don't have no value, no value, no value. Your stock market, your 401 k 3 bc no value in the kingdom of God. So if you spend, listen, I'm just, I'm up. if you spend your whole, all your effort, your energy, your time, busting your tail, yeah, I got this. I got this money. Wow, I'm going to be so, to be so good. It has no value. Then you slip on the banana peel and fall into a highway. And boom, there's the end of that. <laughs> oh, my golly. Then your family will be taken care of, so you think. And you got to stand before Yeshua that how you uh, put all this value in a system that has no value. And, and when you are born again, and you, you're in the house of God, and you hear the word of the living God, and you continue to put value in a system that won't produce any results. So the kingdom of God's system, Father, help us to devote our lives to doing things and creating a culture that's your culture. I'm, I'm going to read it again, the culture, this culture of love and mercy and forgiveness, giving and thankfulness, receiving. It's a culture of being blessing and bringing other people into a right relationship with God. Go with me to Exodus 34. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit just some of the highlights here. And this is Moses. God is starting a new system. Um, they, they've never experienced this before. Um, the Lord said to Moses, Exodus 34, 1, cut two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. The just so that you catch you up on it, um, God has picked Moses out. He was born in Egypt, um, saved his life, and then he's going to use him to, to uh, fulfill his covenant, his promise to Israel. Even though Israel's just really slaves, they're just slaves for the Egyptians. They're building pyramids and, and other things, they're slaves. They don't have any level of freedom, none at all. They're, they're born into slavery. They live in slavery and they die in slavery. 
They have no freedom whatsoever. They're slaves. But God has made a covenant with Abraham. And they're offspring of Abraham. But God allows it to run its course before he steps in. And they multiply. And now they're a great, a powerful people. But they're slaves. So God sends Moses back to set the people free. To bring freedom to the Israelites. It's, he didn't bring freedom to the whole world. Yeshua did. But he brought freedom to the Israelites. Hmm. Because they had a covenant with God and God has a plan and he's executing his plan. Can I tell you this? He has a plan for you too and he's executing that plan. He's executing his plan for you, for your house, for your children, for your resources, for your next level of life. I mean, God, and he's the miraculous God, the miracle working God. But, but he's creating in you an atmosphere for miracles. The reason, one of the reasons he drew you to this house because there's an, there's an atmosphere of miracles in this house. There's things that have never happened that are happening. Um, let, me, let me just park just for a half a second. How many uh, you you've, have experienced just in the last couple years either some level of healing where God has touched your family or touched you or healed your physical body or provision? God has given you some level of provision that you didn't have, but was supernatural, just kind of, or a supernatural encounter. Um, it's like Peter walking on the water. That, that wasn't healing. It wasn't provision, but it was a supernatural encounter, right? How many, if you've experienced either one of those three, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to, I want you to take a moment and look around. How many people have experienced that within the last 90 days? 90 days. I'm just telling you, he's on. The kingdom of God is in and it's on. And God, things, watch this, in the kingdom, things start like this. They start small and they grow big. It starts small. So the momentum, raise your hands again, those of you who raise your hands. So the momentum is just this. But this is small. This is really small. You mean you see probably about 70% of the hands are up. That's, this is small. There's hands who are watching online that are up. This is small. What's going to happen is God is, is taking this and he's going to spin it. And it's going to be crazy. Crazy. Unbelievable. Crazy. Deaf ears, blind eyes. Why? Because the atmosphere has changed. The atmosphere has changed. And then things that could never happen, ever happen, ever ever here will happen here. So Moses breaks the first tablets because the people have rebelled because he's up in the mountain hanging out with God and they think that he's dead so that some of the leaders just depart and they they go to a different system. And then um, God says to Moses, get down those guys that you brought out of, out of captivity. They have corrupted themselves. And, and then Moses says to God, you mean the people that you brought out? <laughs> With the power of your hand, your people? <laughs> All right. So he goes down and he's frustrated and he breaks the first tablets and makes dust some stuff, makes them eat, drink it in water and that was mixed with dust. I mean, it's just... He, then he comes back and he's, he's out on Mount Sinai and he's picking this up again. And Moses is trying to make it right. So God says, give, give me some more tablets. I'm giving you the law in which we're going to operate in. Be prepared by morning. Come up to Mount Sinai, verse 2. And stand before me on the mountain. And no one may come up with you. In fact, no one should even be seen anywhere on the mountain. Don't even let them touch, not, not their flocks, their herds. They can't even graze on the mountain. And Moses cut two stone tablets like the first ones. Let me just say to this, you're walking with God, it's work. Right? It's, it's work. If you're going to serve God, it's work. 
If you're going to be a difference maker in your community, it's work. If you're going to make a difference to the poor, it's work. You're going to have to give towards that. You're going to have to cook the food. You're going to have to serve the food. And some of the people are, I don't like it like this. But it's free for you, bro. Come on, man. What are you, are you paying for this? Get me out of here. I don't like that. This mine is burned. I don't like that. That's a, what is this anyway? Why are you serving us this? You don't have to do this. Walk around. Walk around. You know? But you got to do that with a smile. And you know why? Because literally you're this guy's servant. Because he, your father, has called you to come serve this guy who's homeless and struggling and bitter and angry and you're there trying to serve him. Well, that's the right thing to do. But you're going to have to put up with some stuff too. But when I get a little frustrated by that, God reminds me of the guy that did this. Because he was looking at me and saw me in my shortcomings and knew that the only way that I could get to life is if he gave his. So who am I? to complain. So Moses cut two new stone tablets, like the first ones, verse 4. He got up early in the morning, and taking the two stone tablets in his hands, he climbed Mount Sinai, just as the Lord had commanded him. Listen, this is not easy stuff. This is, you got you to gotta carve out from the rock these these tablets and, and then you got to carry them up to the top of the mountain and God's going to meet you at the mountain? Why don't you meet me down here at the bottom of the mountain? Yeah. Why don't you carve these two things? I'll just pick them up and meet you right over here, God. And you just inscribe right into them, right? Nope. No, you make them. And you climb the mountain and I'll meet you up there. I'm just telling you sometimes there's some sacrifice that has to be employed for you to get this next level that God has for you. Don't be afraid of the sacrifice. The Lord came down in a cloud, stood with them, proclaimed his name, Jehovah, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, Jehovah. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God. Let me stop for a second. This this is not Moses talking about it. This is not Abraham talking about it. This is the Lord. This is the Lord declaring who he is. I want you to know who I am. I, I want you to understand how I function, how this goes on. I don't, I don't know, care about the culture of what you've heard, but this is the way I am. The Lord himself is declaring to you who he is to you. The Lord is compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger. Slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. That's God. That's the God that you serve. And that's the God that serves you, that fights for you and believes in you and trusts you. And is saying Yeshua to die to give you eternal life. He's compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. You know who else who's like that? You. This should be you. Compassionate. Gracious, slow to anger. Abounding in love and truth. That's you. That should look like you and describe you. Not selfish and angry and stingy and won't give and lazy and unfaithful. That's not us. That's not us. We are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. 
but he will not leave the guilty unpunished bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Hold it. We we can't make it then. If God's going to hold us responsible for our father's iniquities, and pass our father's iniquities on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation, we, we can't make it because the sin in humanity is so prevalent, so strong. I'm responsible now. My kids are responsible for the sins that I've made. And, and my, not only my kids, but my grandkids to four generations of responsibility for the perversions of humanity, we can't make it. We can't make it. There's, there's no, no prayer we can pray, no, no giving that we can give, no nothing. We can't make it. We just, we just, we're all dead. We're all just, we're all, for us, it's a complete failure. But God. God establishes it with Moses. This is the way I am, and this is the standard I've called you guys to rise up to. And then he realizes that we can't rise up to that standard, so he shifts the standard. Deuteronomy 24, 16. Put that up for me, if you would. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, Fathers, are not to be put to death for their children. And the children are not to be put to death for their fathers. Each person will be put to death for his own sin. Hmm. He shifts the system so that we could survive. Because if we're responsible for all of them, No one makes it. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. When you reap the harvest in your field, and you forget a sheaf in the field, do not go back to get it. It is to be left for the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Listen. God says, you, 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 can't, you can't live perfect. You're corrupt. You're jacked up. There's the standard of holiness that I've established in the, in, the, in the universe. I've applied that standard to you, and you can't live up to that standard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it and give you a, a grace. I'm going to change it and give you a, a, an out so that you can, even when you make mistakes, even when you fail, even when you lie, even when you're divorced for the 37th time. And it is not my way, and it's not my desire, and it doesn't meet my standard. I'm still going to reach down and meet you where you are. And I'm going to love you in spite of yourself. And I'm going to give to you and make a way and heal you and restore you and bless you because I'm faithful. I'm the gracious God who forgives iniquity, makes a way when there's no way. That's who you've been serving. And you got to take that, mold it, and give it away. Here's what, I'm going I'm to close with this. Moses in verse 8, God speaks to him, and he, and he walks through that, and Moses immediately knelt low on the ground in worship. This is Moses. This is, this is, this is man. Moses is going to do some extraordinary things. 
And he says, Moses says, Lord, if I've indeed found favor with you, please go with us. Even though this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our iniquity and our sin and, and accept us as your own possession. And the Lord responds, I'll make a covenant in the presence of all these people. I'll perform wonders that have never been done in the whole earth or in any nation. And all the people you live among will see the Lord's work for what I am doing with you is all inspiring. I'm going to stop there. Here's what God's saying. I'm going to do extraordinary things through you. I'm going to do things that have never been done, never happened, but I'm doing them now. I'm going to open up your eyes to see, your ears to hear, your mind to understand. And even though you're sinful and you don't really qualify for this, it doesn't matter what you qualify. I'm doing a great work during this hour. And I love you and I'm for you and I'm the compassionate God. But you will see signs and wonders and I will build a great nation out of you, Moses. And he's doing it again. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are the living God and this is your way. Thank you for healing and provision, for supernatural encounters, for things that we have never been able to do or see or experience that now during this hour. But it's not for our glory, it's for your glory. It's not for our sake, it's for your own name's sake. Father, change Seattle. Flip, flip this region first, Lord. Can you flip this region first, Lord? Every home, every family, every household, every suburb, every small city. But when we say Seattle, we don't just mean Seattle proper, Lord. We mean every community that's here in the Northwest. Change your sons and daughters. Change us. Change our personal perspective, change our families, change our children, 